So when he says being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, he means as a result of your being in Christ and for our purpose to the glory and praise of God. So those verses were some of our key verses in, in chapter 1. Of course, another key verse, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1, uh, 21. And remember Paul there in that first chapter said that he was hard-pressed between two things, either going on to ultimately be with the Lord or to stay with them. But he ultimately said, I know that it's better for me to be with you now. And so he thought that that would truly be the case. Now, why would he talk about not knowing what's going to happen? Because he's in prison, remember, in Rome. And this epistle is one of the prison epistles. But remember, too, it's been called Paul's love letter to the church because this congregation obviously meant so much to him and had a deep affection for the Philippian brethren. They had been with him, as he pointed out in chapter 1, from the first day until now, uh, fellowship with him. What kind of fellowship did they have? Not just that they were brothers and sisters in Christ with him, but they had what? Helped him financially. They helped him financially. Now, in today's lesson in this chapter, a little bit later on, we're going to see how it was that they were able to help him. When we get to verses 25 through 30, and I'm saving those verses in chapter 2 for the lesson in the worship hour, because uh, the sermon that I want us to consider the, this morning in the worship hour, I'm calling it the epitaph of Epaphroditus. He's going to introduce us to a man named Epaphroditus who brought help from Philippi to Paul. Uh, in other words, funds to help him. But I call it, I call the sermon the epitaph of Epaphroditus because he almost died uh, serving God. In other words, he was so unselfish that he almost died. He was sick almost to death. And I call it the epitaph of Epaphroditus because I want us to look at it a little bit later on. How would his epitaph have read on his tombstone if he had died? But we'll get to that Lord will the next hour. But that also reminds us of why chapter 2 we call the self-emptying life. So, uh, Savior-centered living was chapter 1. I call chapter 2 here the self-emptying life because Paul uh, stresses the need for genuine humility and sacrifice and not being lifted up with pride but being filled with genuine uh, humility here. So that's what we're going to uh, kind of emphasize as we go through uh, chapter 2 of uh, Philippians, the self-emptying life. In other words, he's going to plea here for unity through humility. Uh, can you have unity in the church with pride being prevalent in the church? No, you'll never have unity with pride being present, uh, not just prevalent, <laughs> but present even, really. Uh, you can't have that unity. You can only have that true unity through genuine uh, humility. And so that's what Paul is pushing for here, or pleading for here. Now he's not saying in his plea for unity that they were terribly divided. Later on he is going to talk about two of the uh, sisters in Christ who seemed to be having a little bit of disagreement, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a congregation-wide thing, and uh, it didn't seem to be anything that couldn't be addressed uh, successfully. But generally speaking, he's pleading with them to uh, maintain the unity that they already have and correct what might be lacking in terms of Euodia and Syntyche, whom he will mention uh, a little bit later on in a further study that we'll have. So, with that uh, kind of in mind for some background and review, uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 uh, from the New King James, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, 
but also for the interest of others. So, in these first four verses, we have this plea for unity. And in verse 1, he gives us some motives for that unity. Here are some motives for achieving that unity. When he says, if, and when he mentions if, and I think I've mentioned this before, the word if in the original language here does not carry the idea of any kind of doubt uh, at all in the Greek, in the original. But the idea here is uh, if there is consolation, and there is. <laughs> in other words, it's more the idea of since there is. Since there is consolation. He's not doubting that there is. He's saying because there is, in effect. Because there is, or since there is, what? Consolation in Christ. Well, that's a motive. Uh, do we have any consolation in Christ? Well, of course we do. Encouragement. <laughs> We've got all, that's all we do have is in, in Christ. But what's the key? In Christ is the key. All these motives are dependent upon one being what? In Christ. Now, there are those who have false consolation thinking they're following Christ, but tragically they're not. But if you're truly in Christ, then there is consolation beyond comprehension, really. But what else? if any, comfort of love. Is there any love among the body of uh, believers? Well, of course. In fact, we just talked about it in reviewing chapter 1, increasing and abounding in that love. And is love comforting? Of course it is. Of course it is. What about if any fellowship of the Spirit? Well, yes, we have fellowship with the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit he's referring to here. Well, when did we enter into fellowship with the Spirit and with the Godhead as, as a whole, for that matter? When we obey the gospel. Uh, that's when, remember Romans 8, 26? Uh, Romans 8, 26 for, let's just turn over and look at that passage because it's a very important passage from the standpoint of, of conversion and when that is culminated or completed. Uh, in 826, likewise, the Spirit, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, I'm in the wrong verse here, uh, yeah, let's see, uh, 16, not 26, Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, and so forth. How does the Spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God? Well, it's the Holy Spirit through the Word that tells us what? Believe, repent, confess, and what? Be baptized. That's a teaching of the Spirit. When our spirit, when our human spirit, responds and complies with the teaching of the Spirit, do we enter into fellowship with the Spirit at that point? Yes. Yes. So when Paul talks about the fellowship of the Spirit here, He's talking about the fellowship into which we enter when we obey the teachings that the Spirit has given us. How do those teachings come to us today? Through the Word. That's the only way that we have. So, we are in fellowship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as a result of what? Our spirits complying with what the Holy Spirit through the Word has taught us. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, then he adds another motive. If any affection and mercy. Well, of course, without mercy, uh, there'd be no point in even being a member of the Lord's church, really, would there? In other words, uh, it's God's mercy that brought us to church through Jesus Christ and His compassion and mercy. And when it's all said and done and we've done the best we can to live the Christian life as a part of the Lord's church, we're still going to be dependent upon God's mercy, aren't we? God's grace. But who will be the recipients of God's grace? Those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ. So God's grace has its limits. It only extends to those who will what? Who will accept God's grace by what? By obeying the truth and living the truth. Or by grace you've been saved through faith. That's obedient faith. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Titus 2.11. What? teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live lower, uh, soberly, righteously, godly in the present age. We have to respond to it. So, the affection and the mercy are a part of those, again, who are in Christ. So, in all of these motives in verse 1, the key is in Christ. In Christ. 
Then he goes on in verse 2, fulfill my joy. Since, they, since all these motives are held out to you here, fulfill my joy by being what? Like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Well, that's unity he's pleading for, obviously. You remember in the uh, Corinthian, 1 Corinthian epistle, there was a problem, remember, at Corinth there, because they were not being like-minded. Uh, there were those who were preacher followers, some who were following different uh, ones. And, um, they don't have the journey fast. No, it still hasn't changed. In fact, that reminds me of an illustration that uh, that uh, Mark Teske used this morning in the Good News Today program. He was talking about uh, preachers who may kind of get the big head sometimes, and talk about an illustration where a preacher who preached a sermon preached a sermon that Sunday morning that he thought, buddy, that was spot on. That was good stuff, you know. So in the car driving home after the service, he, he asked his wife, he said, how many great preachers do you know? And she said, one less than you think. <laughs> so, that's, so that's, that's pretty good. She's honest. She was honest. So, you, uh, so there were those who preacher followers and uh, and uh, those who were willing to be followed, apparently, to at Corinth. But he said, I plead with you that you all speak the same things, and uh, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1 10. So, very similar plea. But, but the, plea, uh, the plea here to the Philippians uh, is a positive plea, if you will, whereas with the Corinthians, it was more of a negative one because they were having some severe problems. Philippi was not. Uh, so it's more of a reinforcement here to the Philippians, reinforcing the unity that they, uh, that they already uh, had. So, uh, via the same mind, one accord, one mind. Then verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Boy, what a wonderful world this would be if everybody followed that, you know, and esteemed others better than self. But it's interesting, he's not saying that you should not have any self-esteem, obviously, because that can be problematic. A lack of self-esteem can lead to problems, uh, too. But a healthy self-esteem. And so... Uh, esteem others better than self, but he doesn't say don't don't have any self-esteem. In fact, the next verse, verse 4, notice he says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. He doesn't say don't look out for your own interest at all. Just forget yourself completely in your own interest and think about others totally. He said, no, not only for your own self, but also for the interest of others. And Consider them better than self. You know, 1 Timothy 5.8 says that uh, there Paul wrote to Timothy and said, If anyone will not provide for his own, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And he's talking about in the context of take care of widows and those who were uh, widows in the church and family that had should take care of them if they can. So he's saying... Uh, one who does not take care of his own in that sense has denied the faith and is worse than unbeliever. That's pretty serious language, isn't it? So we've got to provide for our own and for our own selves. What about the first and great commandment, love the Lord your God with all, God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? And Jesus said in Matthew 22, 39, and the second is like it, you shall what? Love your neighbor as yourself. He never said don't love yourself. But make sure your love for self doesn't exceed your love for others and obviously your love for God. But uh, healthy, an unhealthy self-esteem can lead to some major psychological issues and problems that can cause other problems. But uh, so uh, we need to not only look out for ourselves but also for the interest of others and put others uh, first. So then now we'll go to the passage that Ian read. 
verses 5 through 8. And this is really going to be the passage that describes the man we're going to study in the worship hour, Epaphroditus, uh, who emulated the mind of Christ definitely and sacrificed so much as we'll see when we get to that, that lesson a little later. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it proper to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, and then we'll go on through verse uh, 11, therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So in verses 5 through 8, really Paul issues his final appeal for unity. He's given them plenty of motives to be united already, but here's the, here's the culmination. This is the crowning uh, motive and appeal. In other words, look to Jesus and look at what he gave up. Look at the humility that he demonstrated. And that should be more than sufficient to cause us to be uh, humble. So, in describing that humility, though, he tells us that initially he did not consider it proper to be equal with God. So, he was completely equal with God, member of the Godhead. And of course, John 1, verse 1, reminds us of that. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, that's Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But a little later on in chapter 1, down in verse 14, he tells us that the Word, what, became flesh and dwelt among us. So that is the change that John describes that... Um, that Paul is also referring to here. He did not consider it proper to be equal with God. He had every right to be equal with God, but he was willing to sacrifice that equality. Um, when he said he made himself of no reputation, the American standard there says, renders it, he emptied himself. Now, when, he, when, it said, when that version says he emptied himself, it doesn't mean that he emptied himself of his deity. Obviously, he was still deity while they lived among men, but he obviously had undergone a change and had become subject to the Father as he was born uh, a woman, virgin birth, and lived among men. And uh, so what we see in verse 8 is his humiliation because he humbled himself and died the most humiliating death that one could possibly undergo at that time. It was reserved for the, uh, the most heinous criminals, uh, crucifixion was, and yet that's how he was willing to die. But in the verses we read from 9 through 11, that every, that at every, therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that's his exaltation. So verses 5 through 8 describe his humiliation Verses 9 through 11 describe his exaltation back to the right hand of the Father where he is now reigning as king over his kingdom, the church, and as high priest uh, for us. Uh, so we have a mediator uh, and the perfect mediator and that is uh, Jesus Christ. Now, when you come to verse 12 beginning, Therefore, and remember we've said, when you see therefore, you want to know what's it, what's it there for? Well, I think it really goes all the way back to his death on the cross, that he was willing to humble himself and uh, become obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, since he was willing to do that, Paul is saying now, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, let this continue, that sacrifice of Christ, let that continue to motivate you to continue to obey. But look how he compliments them. He doesn't say, 
you haven't obeyed always, but now I hope you will. No, he's saying, as you have always obeyed. Uh, so he commends the fact that they've been faithful. But doesn't that indicate that even though we're faithful, we're, we're trying to grow, we're studying, that there's never a point where we can just completely relax and say, I know as much as I need to know and so forth. I love as much as I need to love, as we referred to earlier. No, we want to keep on, keep on, and, uh, and, and grow. That's the beauty of Scripture, is that you can go back to it day in and day out, and you're still going to gain more from it if you approach it in the right way. You'll never exhaust uh, all the uh, depth uh, of the Word of God. Now, you can exhaust enough of it to know exactly how to obey the gospel and become a Christian and how to live as a Christian, but that still doesn't mean that you can't gain from it further study. So, therefore, as we look through verse 15, verses 12 through 15, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Um, so, in 12 through 15, and then, well, let's go on through, uh, through 16. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. So, in this section... He tells us that Christians are what? Christians are light bearers. Uh, we are to be bearers of the light. But in uh, verse uh, 12, latter part of verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and dream. Well, again, doesn't that tell us that there's a work that we have to do and despite the fact that most of the denominational world just cringes at the thought that anybody has to do any work in order to be saved, but that all the work has been done and you just simply accept Jesus and invite him into your heart and you're saved. The scriptures teach nothing of that sort. In fact, here's just one of many passages that teach just the opposite. Work out your own salvation with fear and turn. You remember the first time the gospel was preached in Acts chapter 2. And uh, in Acts 2.40, after, uh, after Peter had preached to them, uh, verse 38, and they had cried out in verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? They believed that, that wasn't sufficient. Otherwise, why didn't Peter say, well, you obviously believe that's all you need to do just now accept Jesus. No, he said, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and so forth. Then, then he, with verse 40 says, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying what? Save yourselves from this crooked generation. There it is again. Save yourselves. Well, if faith only saves, then when they express their belief by crying out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Why would he exhort with many other words and say, save yourselves? There's still something more. He'd already told them what more they needed to do. Then verse 41 says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. It's pretty clear. It's very clear, isn't it? So, save yourselves. Work out your own salvation. So in both instances, in one instance, that save yourselves command was given to those that still outside of Christ as to how to get into Christ. They had to do something, be baptized after believing, repenting, and confessing Christ, of course. But even to those who had done that now, faithful brethren, still the admonition is what? Keep on working. There's still a work that you must do. But that's the, that's the tragic part of the confusion that arises, and it shouldn't, is that people fail to distinguish among the different kinds of works that the scriptures mention, some of which are of no value. The law of Moses can't save you. That law has been nailed to the cross. So those works of the law 
are clearly condemned in Scripture for the Christian. You don't do that. You don't do that. We're under a new covenant. But, and what about works that we would try to boast about? We've talked about them many times. Works that I would boast about by which I've saved myself. You can't do that. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, but what kind of works, Paul? Lest anyone should boast. Boastful works are condemned. Works of the law of Moses are condemned. Boastful works that I try to come up with to save myself, I can't do that. But what about works that God has set forth? Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand. That's the key. The good works are the ones God has prepared. And that involves hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, and then following the New Testament commands to continue to work out our own salvation by doing our part. Well, does he say anything about God's part? Yes, verse 13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. How does God produce a will within us that makes us want to do right? And how does God produce a desire in us to actually not only want to do what's right, but to actually follow through with it and do it? To will and to do. God, he says, works in you to create your desire and then for your follow-through. But how does he do that? Through the Word. Through the Word. That's how God works in us. You tell me some other way that God works in you to create your desire and then to tell you what to do. If, if as some claim it's the direct operation of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is directing people in all sorts of different directions which we know he would not do. Because there are myriads of people who claim to be directly led by the Holy Spirit apart from this word who are doing things that are contrary to each other in terms of their religious practice. That would make God the author of confusion, which the scripture tells us he is not. He is not. So God works in us through the word. And then he tells us in verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may be what? Blameless and harmless. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. It's interesting that he says that you may be blameless and harmless in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. If we are to be lights in the midst of a crooked in the first generation, what if we join a monastery and become like some of these monks through the years who have believed that the only way to really be holy is to just remove yourself from the world altogether? Doesn't that deny monasticism? That denies the idea of monasticism that some have mistakenly and erroneously practiced for years. No, we don't go out of the world. We stay in the world and we are a light in the world. And so, we don't pray that God would take us out of the world, but as I mentioned before, we pray that He would take the world out of us, <laughs> worldliness out of us, and let us be the right kind of influence. <clears throat> but among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast. I think some translations put holding forth. Well, really, both ideas are true. As far as the light of the gospel, we are to hold fast to it, not change it. But we're also to hold it forth, aren't we? And to take it to others. So hold fast while you hold forth. Really, uh, both renderings would be, would be accurate. But now notice he says, I want you to do that so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. What's the day of Christ? The judgment that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. You remember to the Thessalonians, and I've mentioned this passage before when we talked about will there be recognition in heaven? To the Thessalonians, he said, what is our glory or joy or hope of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the day of our 
Lord Jesus Christ at His appearance and His coming. To the Thessalonians, He said, I hope to see you there in the judgment and hear you approved of God and Christ and rejoice over that. Well, if He didn't know who they were, how could He rejoice over them? He couldn't. Here's the same thought here to the Philippians. I want you to hold fast till the very end, till the day of Christ, so that I'll know that I have not run in vain or lived in vain. Now, if he didn't know who the Philippians were at that judgment, he wouldn't know whether he labored in vain or not labored in vain. So, so there are several passages that make it abundantly clear that we will recognize each other. So, then he says, yes, verse 17, yes, and if I'm being poured out as a drink offering and a sacrifice of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Now this is another statement that indicates what? I'm in prison. I don't know if I'm going to get out. I'm confident I will. But it could be that I will be like a drink offering in terms of sacrifice for you. That drink offering is a, refer a reference back to the Old Testament sacrifices. And you have passages like Numbers 15, 15, Numbers 28, verse 7, and verse 14, that just mentioned the drink offering that was poured over the animal sacrifice as a part of the process, uh, part of the many sacrifices and offerings that they made. So Paul is talking about his own life being poured out on the altar, so to speak, uh, as a sacrifice. It's just a figurative uh, reference, obviously. Then we'll about wind up here because I said I'm going to save verses 25 through 30 for the lesson of worship hour. But he commends Timothy here in verses 19 through 24. Paul's son in the gospel. He wanted to know what the state of the Philippians was, how they were doing. He loved them so much. So he said, I'm hoping to send Timothy to you as soon as I see how it goes with me. If I'm going to make it or not. And then, I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come uh, shortly. So Timothy was, at times he called him his son in the gospel, at times his, uh, his co-laborer or fellow worker or bond servant, but he loved Timothy dearly. And he said there's so many who seek their own interests, but not Timothy. You can rely on him. So we'll stop there. and. Uh, as I said, the sermon will involve that man named Epaphroditus. Thank you so much. Brother Jim, at the end of Hebrew, where, of course, who the Hebrew writer is, says that he would be released or would be it don't say if Timothy got in trouble or something, does it? Doesn't say what now? That in in Hebrews, in the end of Hebrews, thirteen at the end. Uh huh. It says that Timothy, and it makes me think, you know, of course, it don't make any difference who wrote it. Oh yeah, but it's you know, I think Timothy. all the personally, I think the preponderance of the evidence both, both uh, points to Paul. As the writer, and that's another that's a statement that's a further indication of it. Yeah, but I wanted to know when it says he has set at liberty, was he, you know, was he in prison someplace? Yes, he was with him at some point in time. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, apparently, he put himself in jeopardy at times just to encourage Paul and be a helper to him. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would give. Yeah, yeah. Because it has been set free, so you can't be set free unless you weren't were not free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good point. He's